Hello, I'm Joseph Culinary, Music Director for the Glimmer Glass Festival, and this is Keeping Time with Culinary. <laughs> In this mini course, we will take an overview of the art of opera from its beginnings through the present day. We'll examine its forms and talk about the voices, orchestra, and most of all, the music. We'll also examine and demystify some of opera's terminology along the way. I hope this series might serve as an introduction for those new to the art form and as a review for experienced opera goers who might find themselves listening with a new set of ears. The series is presented as six short videos. Each video will include a playlist with links that will help illustrate some of the topics and ideas we examine. Please use these links as a guide and a portal for further listening. So, Let's enter this fascinating world of storytelling and music. Last time, we explored the singing voice, its categories and classifications, and how it can be used to create a character. Today, let's look at the relationship of the voice and the orchestra as a means of amplifying the expressive and storytelling capabilities of opera. The singing voice, as we said in our last session, is central to opera because the voice carries the text. In opera jargon, we call this text the libretto, Italian for little book, because the libretto was published as a small booklet that could be purchased at an operatic performance for the use of the audience during the performance. Since in the early days of opera, house lights were not dimmed, the audience could read the libretto and follow the story. A rather early nod, I think, to the concept of modern day supertitles. Composers worked closely with librettists during the composition of an opera. Once the source material, uh, perhaps a play or a novel or a poem, was identified for the opera's subject, it was usually the librettist's job to adapt this material by sketching out a scenario. The metric text was created next in the process and sent to the composer who began setting it to music. The Italians had a saying, prima le parole, Poi la musica, meaning first the words and then the music. And that indicated the usual order of composition. That is, the words inspired the music. In the early days, operas were often composed in great haste. Rossini's two-week work period for the Barber of Seville is a good example. Sometimes, the composer would arrive in the city set for the premiere and be handed the libretto for the first time, necessitating the use of certain musical formulas to ensure swift completion of the opera by the premiere date. Later in the 19th century, specifically with the advent of Giuseppe Verdi and his deep understanding of the integration of drama and music, we find a much more fraught process with librettist and composer, who would often exchange frustrated and even angry letters as differences about the ways the libretto should be shaped were hashed out. One can find ample testimony of this in Verdi's personal correspondence. Of course, some composers circumvented this difficult process by writing their own librettos, as we note in many of the operas of Richard Wagner. But even though the singing voice will carry the text and melody, an accompaniment is necessary 
to fill out the harmonic, coloristic, and even dramatic texture. Instrumental accompaniment can range all the way from a single keyboard instrument to the massive 100-plus member orchestra of Richard Strauss's Elektra. Over the history of opera, the orchestra takes on an increasingly expressive partnering role in the telling of the story. In the days of late 18th century and early 18th century opera, especially in Italy, the orchestra played a rather basic accompanying role. The figuration that they played was subordinate to the voice and provided a basic harmonic underpinning with the occasional doubling of a solo instrument, let's say such as an oboe or a bassoon. The voice had to remain unobscured and front and center at all times. And most importantly, the orchestra is always at the service of the voice, necessitating the instruments and the members of the orchestra to work with the conductor in following the singing line in a seamless, hand-in-glove style. Much more easily said than done. You can check out the playlist after this video to listen to this type of orchestral accompaniment. Now, as orchestral instruments evolved in the 19th century and developed in coloristic, dynamic, and technical capabilities, composers began to take ever greater advantage of this burgeoning world of sonority. Rossini, Donizetti, and Verdi, among others, harnessed the power and poetic expressivity of the orchestra as a way of increasing the dramatic import of an opera. This coincided perfectly with the rise of the Romantic movement in which nature itself, or at least the evocation of natural scenes, was used as a mirror for human emotion. And the expression of human emotion through musical notes, perhaps Verdi's greatest genius, could be movingly conveyed through instrumental means. The playlist that follows contains a few examples of these wonderfully expressive techniques. Richard Wagner, in his pioneering compositional work, began experimenting with changing the balance of voice and orchestra from a sort of 80-20 bel canto balance to an equal footing of 50-50, and sometimes even more. It is no coincidence that such large stentorian voices are required for Wagner's operas, even if just to be able to compete with the massive and voluminous orchestras for which he composed. We must also credit Wagner with the revolutionary and sophisticated development of the leitmotif, or leading theme. Although many other composers employed recurring thematic material in their operas, Wagner brought this technique to the zenith of its development, sometimes using the orchestra to enlighten the audience with information not expressed or even known by the characters on stage. In the final moments of Wagner's Die Walküre, as Brunhilde lies asleep, surrounded by the magic fire, the orchestra thunders out the leitmotif associated with the destiny of Siegfried, who will liberate Brunhilde from the fire in the next opera of the Ring Cycle. Composers were also making use of the orchestra as a way to tell the story, apart from the singers. We've already discussed in a previous session the use of the orchestra as a means of quieting down the audience with a brilliant overture or the setting of an atmospheric scene with a prelude. Now we find the vast coloristic and expressive capabilities of the orchestra brought to the fore in intermezzos or interludes that help to carry the story forward. One of the most beautiful and poignant of these is the intermezzo that precedes Act Three of Puccini's 
Manon Lescaut, which he subtitled The Prison and Journey to La Havre. Through this tender and deeply expressive music, Puccini describes the imprisonment of Manon Lescaut and her lover's vain attempts to free her. And so you can see that as opera evolved and moved through history, the singing voice, once a sole and primary expressive force, was joined in ever-increasing expression by the orchestra to create a unique and symbiotic partnership that is unequaled in the world of the arts. Please join me next time for our final operatic exploration, putting it all together. Thanks for listening.